Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Daylight Talks. Uh, we are very pleased and honored to have here Filippo Pariani and uh, Michele Rossi from Park Associati as today's lecturers. Um, the Daylight Talks is a, a series of free um, online uh, web talks uh, curated by Daylight and Architecture and organized in partnership with several um, prominent uh, architecture schools and universities uh, all around the world. And specifically today, um, this event is hosted by the Politecnico di Milano, represented by Professor Marco Imperadori. Uh, now, the, um, although the focus of the daylight talks is, is always the same, meaning uh, the use of daylight in architecture, uh, we can say that every lecturer and, and speaker actually brings their personal uh, perspective to the topic, uh, so that all students and architects can uh, somehow get challenged and inspired to use uh, to give a, a new role, an innovative role to daylight in their, in their projects. Uh, let me just remind you that all the previous uh, recordings of the lectures are available on the site, um, daylightinarchitecture.com. Just like this session as well will be available shortly after the live event. Now, let me introduce Professor Imperadori. Uh, Marco Imperadori is full professor at Politecnico di Milano University. Uh, therefore, he's a, a researcher, but he's also a, an architect, a designer. He mainly focuses his interests in, in high energy efficient buildings and in, in sustainability in general and in structure envelope building systems. Uh, he was a lecturer and a visiting professor in many universities and institutions worldwide. And he also represents Politecnico di Milano in the Active House Alliance, uh, being member of the scientific board and president of the jury for the Active House Awards. So, Marco, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be hosted by Park. Michele and Filippo are also friends. And as a scientific uh, host, I would like to say why uh, I think that uh, they should be you know, uh, visible to all of you and to transmit to all of you soon their own philosophy. S some keywords. So one is contemporaneity and continuity, because their architecture shows how you can be contemporary and express this culture of these times, uh, dialoguing with the city existing. Second point, I think they, they clearly show how you can learn from masters, Renzo Piano and De Lucchi, where they work it, but go beyond. Be going beyond the masters and I think they did it, they have done it and they are continu continuously doing it. Another keyword is very important for me is about lightness, uh, lightness in general and the curiosity and the materiality. Here we have a lot of materials here and also light uh, is a material for them to design. And uh, a very important keyword I would like to spend uh, is, uh, as we are in Milano, the capital of fashion, is about texture and patterns. You always find in their architecture the intriguing and the continuous dialogue with materials and the patterns, the way they go together. And if I have uh, to use a comparison <laughs> as a cho showing a, uh, choosing a stylist, I would say Giorgio Armani. So they, they for me, uh, are giving this kind of very sober and very elegant approach to architecture. And uh, I think that uh, what they have shown, not only Milano, uh, sometimes is really to, to show challenges. Uh, I have in mind the priceless or the cube, so where they really, really, they have given some provocative questions uh, to all of us to show how contemporary architecture is the only chance we have. So for me it's a great pleasure, I have many of my students connected and I am very curious to learn and to, you know, follow their lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You, Mark. So we, we are very happy to be here. We, I am Michele Rossi, uh, together with Filippo Pagliani. We founded Park Associati uh, 21 years ago. And since the beginning, our uh, way of working was really not to be specialized in anything. We work on very different kind of projects since the beginning. Uh, the office now is uh, it's about 60 people and we grow up in a very uh, natural and slow way until uh, five years ago when we have a, a very uh, suddenly uh, grow up, so from 25 we become 50. But during these old years, as I say, the, the way we work was really about getting interest and getting involved in very different kind of projects. So during this 
21 years we work on retail, we did uh, uh, housing, we did uh, also restaurants, in different kind of interiors projects. And then we, in the last five years we really been involved in a lot of student housing, uh, also master plan. Uh, this is uh, one of our last projects we just uh, uh, recognized as the first prize for this Bovisa master plan uh, one week ago. So uh, the, the fact that we be involved in such a different kind of project was really, uh, I think, develop a, in our office a way of researching and making research a very important issue because every single time we have to you know, approach a different theme, it, approach a different uh, world of, uh, of designing. And so we always realized that the research was very important until our method about the research was really a little bit in crisis because the time of projects was so fast that we didn't have the time to, uh, to make research, to, to propose something new. So we, we were living a kind of paradox where clients request us to, to have new solution, innovative solution, but at the same time was, were always giving us less and less time. So two years ago we founded this uh, little branch inside of our office called Park Plus. And Park Plus is really the place where research has the time to, to try new things, to, uh, to make mistakes, to go back, because research is about that. And projects doesn't have time anymore to do that. Um, so uh, we always talk about our work uh, using three keywords that uh, are very important for us. One, the first one is listening. It's, uh, it's important because listening for us means also respect. Respect of the place where we are going to work, the place where we are going to put our project. Uh, it can be a landscape, it can be a city, it can be uh, a, an industrial area as in this project for Saleva. But it's always very important to, for us to understand where are the boundaries of our projects. And of course, listening means also listening to our clients. The, the, we are trying always to craft around our client the right projects, and we are trying to give always a different answer to the different questions <coughs> that we are asked for. The second word that we always usual, uh, use is intuition, because as we have a very a uh, rational way of approaching projects. Uh, even if we, we start always with a data analysis, of course, only data analysis cannot really create anything exciting. So we call intuition the way all this data analysis and all this data are connected together. We know that we can connect this data in, in a very different ways. And, you know, intuition is the way that we think is more interesting for that project. The third one is experimentation. As we say, research is really a great part of our work. And uh, we always thought that uh, uh, research and experiment on materials, and can, it can be new materials, but it can also be a traditional material used in an in a innovative way, is all, it, it can always be a very important key of our work, of any work, of any project, you know, even the, the less interesting project can achieve something more interesting using this key element of experimentation. Um, so we decided to call our lecture design by daylight because instead of showing you and talking to you about uh, projects, we really would like more to talk about our process and how uh, we work on, on projects and uh, daylight is one of our uh, main issues together with some other issues of course but uh, we try to use this lecture as a way of uh, telling our work through uh, three different themes related to daylight. The first one is courtyard because uh, we, we, you know, looking back to our projects there are a lot of projects where we use courtyard of buildings as a, a meaning of bringing lights to buildings. Courtyard is a very Milanese uh, um, 
project themes. You know, a lot of uh, uh, Milanese buildings have this great courtyards and I think it's, it's uh, something that we really can connect in our work. And so around courtyard we always try to, to give something that gives new quality to existing buildings or to new buildings. Uh, the second one is facade and scheme because you know it's, it's usually the main issues of architecture is really how to connect with uh, daylight and how to protect from daylight, how to bring daylight to the building. And the skin of a building is always something that for us is have to really be designed around the idea of how much light we want to bring in, in the project. And the third one is, is a sky light because uh, again, uh, the, the, the light is very important from facade, but we always think that the light coming from above is really important. So as much as we can, we try to give this design issue uh, the <coughs> most important uh, part of the design as possible. So I, I leave to Filippo the first part of our three themes. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be here. Uh, this, this lecture for us was very interesting because we forced us to think about the theme of light that has been always uh, obviously uh, an element very strong in our architecture. And uh, we are always think that is something very natural, but at the end you have to study on it and to understand how to work on it. So starting from courtyards, that was one of our first chapter uh, about this uh, uh, discussion, let's say. Um, as Michele said, uh, this is a, a thing very Milanese uh, that uh, let us, uh, brought us into uh, uh, the connection of buildings and the heart of the buildings uh, where we believe that uh, in, the, in this part we can really bring a sort of uh, new life, new energy if we start working on, uh, on correctly on, uh, on this element in, 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 in this direction. So the first project uh, we, we we want to uh, represent is uh, Brisa, number five, is a building from uh, Piero Portaluppi. Uh, it's, a building, it's an important building in the center of the city. And I'm not going to describe the whole process that uh, transformed uh, uh, this building. Uh, I'm just telling you that, uh, as, you, as you have seen uh, in the first picture, we added also a, a, a mini, a, let's say, a minimalist element on the on the top of the roof of the existing building. But I'm going to talk, especially for the what we wanted to, how we try to transform this courtyard in something new, in in a, in a sort of, as I said, a, a sort of a new layer. Uh, and this process of going from, uh, from a vertical section that uh, can transform a place, as uh, you can see here on the left, was exactly the idea of, of changing the function of uh, um, a, a, a space that it was under the courtyard, the existing courtyard, that it was a storage, uh, a storage area that we uh, we remove completely and we, we open to, to air in the sense that we wanted to bring a new life, a, a new connection um, uh, to the external part of this, of this space uh, where meeting rooms and offices uh, overlook. So this process was very uh, strong in terms of what we did uh, uh, at the building and you can see in this section so uh, you you can understand that uh, when you approach uh, a project uh, with an, uh, such a strong idea uh, immediately you bring a sort of new life uh, a new a new force inside the building and uh, a new way of living it uh, and we believe that really we achieved this uh, this thing uh, and these pictures show very very 
clearly that uh, now uh, the life of this building changed completely since we, we transform it uh, in this direction. Another project, not very far from the one we saw to now, is Cordusio. It's called Cordusio Number no. 2. It's in Piazza Cordusio. It was an important project of renovation of a building of the beginning of 19th century. And also in this case, as you can see here on the left, courtyard. It, it was, a, 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 let's say, a, a central part of the building with a, not a very strong empathy of, we, of what we can have uh, in terms of connection with the life of the internal spaces of the, of, of the building. So we, um, if we make a distinct, if we try to, to, to create a link between, for example, the project of Brisa and this one, uh, we work, uh, if in Brisa we work in a vertical way, here we try to work in a horizontal way. So we, we understood that we have to, to give a new sort of life to the building. We have to uh, create a sort of connection between the piazza and the, uh, and the streets that we, we had uh, all around. And this, this new passage, uh, create a, a, an horizontal connection, very strong, and uh, we decided to close with a, a skylight the central courtyard so that this horizontal element becomes a, a new floor, a new floor of connection, a, a new floor of, uh, of uh, human life, let's say. Uh, I'm not going to describe but, uh, what, how the, this transformation was done in, uh, in deeply, but you can see in these pictures that obviously the, the building now has a new look, a new way of, of, uh, of uh, a new dialogue with the people that, that uh, live it. And uh, we believe that it's very, it changed completely his, uh, the perception that we have also from the piazza. A project of a completely different scale uh, is also another project of renovation, uh, is Pirelli 35. This is a project that we are doing with uh, Snoeta Architects. Uh, it was a competition that we won one, uh, one uh, year and a half. Uh, and here you have the comparison of what is the, pre uh, the, the original building from Melchiorre Bega of the 50s and what is going to be now. I'm not going to describe you uh, the, the, the general project is a very, is a very big uh, uh, surface in general for, for this project, but I'm going to describe you also in this case how we try to transform uh, the back of the building in something completely different. Uh, the interesting thing of this project is that if we have to compare with the other two, uh, this scale brought us uh, into a, a, a much stronger urban way of looking at the, at the project. And this, um, let's say, this urban way of, of looking at it uh, uh, brought us to, to, to work in, in this sort of horizontal connection between Piazza Inaudi uh, and uh, all the back of the building. Uh, try, trying to force the idea that natural light uh, has to become and, and to be the strong part of, of the project. We really believe that uh, with this part of demolition of the existing uh, uh, elements of the back uh, and of the old courtyard, we can bring deeply, horizontally and vertically light, natural light inside the building always in this idea that with light we can bring new life inside the, inside the project. The last project uh, that talks about uh, courtyard is the Nestlé quarter. Uh, this is a different project for the other two because it's a new, new project, uh, start from zero. And the interesting part of this is that uh, since the beginning our client asked us to make a project and to make a building that it was a sort of campus. Uh, that means that the courtyard, internal courtyard, uh, has to be naturally designed uh, in the be uh, since the beginning of the scheme. Here you see the evolution of the 
from the genesis to the to the end of the project where we try to move as much as possible the section and the volumes that uh, we have all around the uh, this idea of a campus element and the interesting thing is that at the end uh, we understood that the courtyard uh, had to become not only uh, uh, let's say uh, a basket where we we could uh, push as much as possible reflection of natural light and uh, quality of natural light but we wanted to work also with the section inside it working with this idea of a sort of hilly landscape so always in this idea of horizontal and vertical section that is something that we like very much work on the on the project uh, in all the project uh, as you can see in these pictures at the end uh, if uh, we try to push as much as possible in in deepness inside the building uh, natural light and this this skylight that is directly connected with the central courtyard became uh, the, uh, a, a sort of a symbolic element that you will find immediately when you enter uh, and, uh, in the building, in this uh, headquarter, uh, in the reception, you, you have this big uh, and huge uh, uh, skylight that, that uh, creates a sort of dialogue and connection with the whole, uh, with the whole building. The second chapter, as we told you, is, uh, is um, skin and, and facade. Um, as Marco Imperatori said, we are very, we like very much working with uh, uh, materials and, uh, and uh, shapes and forms. And we believe that really on, uh, on when we work on, uh, on the buildings, uh, certain buildings, uh, and uh, we try really to work on the envelope uh, uh, in a very subtle way uh, so that we can always bring something new to the, to, to the project. Um, the Saleva project is, uh, for us, uh, has been a very important project. It's a project that we, we signed together with uh, Cino Zucchi. It's in the northeast of, uh, it's in Bolzano, northeast of Italy. Uh, it's a very uh, strong concept. Uh, we decided it was uh, a, a project that came from a competition and since the beginning uh, we decided to work with this double facade in the sense that we wanted, we understood that the, the orientation of the, the build, building was strongly north-south and we decided uh, to give shape uh, to, to the skin and to the volumes by light with two different, completely two different materials. One was the, uh, was the, the, um, the glass that is completely, um, uh, that looks completely the, the mountains that we have in the front and uh, permit us to have uh, a, a total transparency uh, through the building. And the other side, the other three side, east, west, and, and south, are completely covered with this aluminum perforated uh, uh, skin that becomes a sort of uh, um, uh, material that gives shape, uh, expressionist shape to the building. Obviously, in this building, as you can see, light is very important, not only for what we can perceive from inside, but from, from the fact that with light, we uh, really try to work uh, to, to give expression to the, to the shape of the, of the project. And reflection of materials that is not only glass, but is also this skin, as you can see here. Uh, the general reflection and, and light that we, we pushed on the materials has been part of the, of the uh, really uh, codes that we we put inside the inside the project as you can see here for example uh, the aluminum part is is really a way also to to create strong shadows inside the the building when we need to to create shadows uh, with uh, in a particular in a particular way another project 
is Luxotic Headquarters. It's a project, it's a site that we are finishing right now. It's a very important project for us uh, because it's, uh, it's a project where we, uh, we could force our research really in, the, in a direction uh, of to have a very high level of, uh, of performance in terms of envelope and in relation with all the mechanical part of the building. This is a double skin building where uh, the facade is, um, a is, a, is a concave curved uh, glass skin uh, a shape that linked to the idea to embrace the historic part that we have around the building and all the surroundings. We have a fantastic uh, garden that is just in front of the east facade and you can see here in this, uh, in this uh, sketch. So our idea was to create uh, an addition of the existing building with the new building that is a, 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 a very a strong and characterized building made of glass of a, a double skin and this uh, skin uh, brings uh, the buildings in a total transparency and connection with the, with nature outside or we can close it uh, with a sort of uh, uh, some shades uh, movable uh, that are directly connected with the uh, um, systems that control uh, natural light and direct light inside the building. Uh, as you can see here, some pictures, some, <coughs> some images, this project was pushed really in the direction of minimize, minimize as much as possible the elements and to create a, as much as possible this idea of transparency and connection between inter, inter, interior and exterior of, of, uh, of the building. Uh, here you have some uh, renderings that are r really very close to reality, I can tell you. We cannot still show uh, what is the result of the project, but very soon uh, you will see the, the final result. And uh, here on the left and on the right, you understand how this facade will be a sort of, of uh, um, invisible frame uh, that will bring the life of, of the people that work inside uh, really in direct connection with nature and uh, with the historic part that we have around the building. Uh, another project uh, is, uh, you, we call it U1, uh, actually it is the headquarters at Centur. Uh, is a project uh, very close to the building of Nestlé that we saw before. And uh, this project uh, is in Asago. Um, is in this project, uh, the research went uh, on the idea that uh, the fragmentation of, of facade and the, of, of the shape of the building, as you can see here on the, on the right, on the top right, um, um, for the plan, uh, force us to work <coughs> on the on the skin uh, in uh, in a direction that was uh, clearly uh, related to the fact that each part of facade has to create a sort of dialogue with the natural light and uh, uh, and to force as much as possible the uh, the control of natural light inside the building. That means that we work. Um, for most of the facade uh, with the coating system for, for glasses, but for the west, uh, west facade that took a long part of the building, we decided to work with this sort of plissé uh, glass element that you, you see here, that is uh, vertically uh, separated in, in two parts, uh, one uh, <coughs> with the uh, with uh, uh, a, a sort of serigraph drawing uh, on uh, on one one side of the of the um, of the facade, so that we have a natural screen uh, inside the 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 facade, and uh, we give the possibility to to create uh, the perfect uh, relation from interior and, and interior and exterior uh, and the a perfect control of uh, natural light without having anything moving 
but just controlling the shape of the building by <coughs> a simple element that is going to be uh, a sort of uh, uh, sh um, natural shading uh, process uh, related to the shape of, uh, and, and of, of it. Here you have some pictures of, of the site. Also, this one is a project that is, uh, is, wor is going very fast. We will finish for the middle of <coughs> 22. And uh, you have some pictures here of during the site and where you can understand and you can perceive the, the complexity of the, the general shape and facade of the project. I just closed the, this just this uh, uh, passage of, 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 of uh, project uh, on, of, on skin and facade with cube, with the cube. The cube is a project, is a in itinerant journey, is a, is a sort of, uh, it sort of was <coughs> a, a itinerant restaurant uh, that we decided uh, and we were asked by our client uh, that was Electrolux to think about a, a, a capsule, a, an architecture that we that could be easily uh, transported from a place to another. And this adventure brought us everywhere, uh, actually, since the beginning, everywhere in the world. Actually, we went to Brussels, we went to London, Milan, uh, Stockholm, uh, and uh, this, since the beginning, the idea of this uh, project was that uh, without having the, the place, the, the, the static place where the project had to be, we had to work with a, sh with a, with a shape and with a, with a material uh, in a way that uh, we could be always well uh, oriented or, or well controlled uh, in terms of natural daylight inside the, to, uh, to inside the building. That means that uh, this uh, skin that we invented, uh, that we always call a sort of origami, uh, gave us the possibility to give not only shape at, the, uh, at this, uh, uh, this architecture, but to give also the force of communicating it in terms of uh, transparency, uh, shading and also the, the, the passage that we always like to have between interior, internal and external part of the project. So we believe that with this project really we, we could touch a, a high level of performance of what we, we call um, uh, the, 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 the envelope, uh, uh, let's say an ener energetic envelope that uh, can give the correct uh, control of light and temperature inside inside the building. Okay, so the, the third one and last uh, theme is about skylight. And uh, we're going to show you some of these elements where, you know, we, we try to underline how much the light from a vertical source, a vertical window can really give uh, a lot of quality to spaces and, uh, and uh, architecture. Uh, the first project is uh, Joy Otto, is a, is a building from the early 60s from uh, Marco Zanuso, a very important architect and designer in Milan. And uh, our project was really try to give a new life to this building without uh, changing the nature and the character mm -hmm. of this building that it was already very strong in the city. So uh, first we, we, we work on the facade using wood and using glass and uh, metal panel to underline that the building that was built as a, a hotel was now half hotel, the wood part, and half was an office building, the, the metal and glass part. But the second part that it was really interesting for us, so this is before and after, was really working on uh, what we call the fifth uh, uh, facade of the building, the roof, because when Marco Zanuso designed this uh, project, of course, uh, Milan was a different city. It was a city where uh, we didn't have uh, uh, high and tall buildings around, 
but we just only have uh, uh, <coughs> that as a main building. So as you see here, now the, the Zanuso building is surrounded by skyscraper that uh, overlook the roof of the building. So uh, one of the design thing that uh, we wanted to express in our refurbishment project was really try to give a new quality to a roof. So what we did was really to add a new um, building on the roof. And it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, so here we, we, we have a, a, a photo of how from the residential skyscraper uh, we see the building now. So we, we create this new facade using a series of uh, uh, metal grid that uh, cover all the mechanical plants but also create a new uh, executive meeting room on the roof you see here so this part of this grid create this uh, covering of the uh, of the plants but at the same time you know it is also a way to to shade this uh, meeting room with uh, this grid uh, together with glass in a nice and uh, and really uh, interesting way uh, again here, as in the cube, there is this idea of creating two layers, one with glass and the second one with metal that gives quality, gives a lot of shading, a lot of quality of the shade of the building. Um, the second one is the second project that we are on site right now for Luxottica. It's a very different project from the one that uh, Filippo was telling you about before because it's, very, it's a new building here, it's a renovation of a, a very interesting uh, industrial building. As in a lot of these industrial buildings, this is a really a, a building made of skylight. So the, the really interesting part of this is this series of skylight that uh, we thought it was interesting to underline. So what we did is really to open up part of this uh, a uh, massive building with some uh, gardens to, to have a look uh, outside of, of the building, but at the same time to renovate. So these are the, the gardens that we cut out from the, the existing building. But at the same time trying to give a new life, a new quality to the existing structure and the existing skylight scheme that we thought it was really interesting. So we have all this skylight overlooking the north facade that uh, we are just restoring and trying to give as much as possible this industrial quality that they used to have. Uh, the site is massive and it's very interesting and we, we are very, very excited about the result of this project because you will really looking about light and really looking about how this uh, big building will talk about light. Uh, another interesting project for us was uh, Angie headquarters. Again, this is a renovation of a project. It's what we call hard retrofitting because compared to the one that I, sh I was showing you before, the, the Joy Auto from Marco Zanuso, uh, here is a kind of project where we tried to change completely the, the aesthetic of a building because you know, the, the old building was not for us so interesting to to try to preserve and so we we try to give a, a new life trying to demolish demolish some part of the building and create a, something that at the end will look more like a new building than just a restoration but doing that we we also try to create a, because the, the building was very deep to try to create some new uh, elements, vertical elements to bring light inside of a center of a building. So here is the, the, the photos of this new courtyard inside of a building that really creates not only a new way of uh, having natural light but also a way to communicate from two sides of the building overlooking one to the other, a, a little bit like in the Nestlé in a smaller scale.
And also we, we create some halls and some terraces inside of a building overlooking the facade, the north facade. And then we, 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 we would like to present you The Priceless, which is, a, funny enough, a, another traveling restaurant, as the cube was made for uh, Electrolux, this was made for MasterCard. And MasterCard approached us to ask for the same kind of concept that the one of, uh, of Electrolux, but of course he wanted to have a, a different design. So what we work was really try to create something that it was very easy to, to bring to the roof of this uh, building in Piazza Scala in Milan during the Expo. But we also work with this uh, wing overlooking the building uh, and for us was a way to create shade on the building but also to create an, a, a very uh, iconic idea with this golden wing uh, that in the night was really illuminated. So as you see here, we work with a metal sheet that were folded to create a kind of texture of, of metal, as you see here. And this was again a way of control light in some way, but also a way to, to use artificial light reflecting on this surface. So this is really something that is working on two different ways during daytime and nighttime. In nighttime, as you see here, it becomes something that it, it really reflects the light and create a kind of a, a idea of this restaurant on top of the roof. And here you see the inside. So very funny enough, as I say, we, we work on two different traveling restaurants. I think we have the most experienced designer of traveling restaurants in the world because I think there are only two and we did the two of them. So. And I think that's it. So we are very happy if you have any questions and we hope that okay. you enjoy. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for your, your very insightful and, and, and inspiring lecture. Um, I think that you touched a lot of very, very interesting topics that probably would deserve a deeper look into, you know. Um, we, uh, as I can see, we don't have any questions so far. Uh, so waiting if, for, for, for anybody who wants to ask something. Um, but let me say something, just, you know, to, to some free thoughts. Um, I, I really appreciated a few of the things that, that you said. I mean, I appreciated everything, obviously, but some, some of the topics are, are, I think, are particularly uh, inspiring to me. Um, first of all, the importance that you give to intuition from the beginning, right? That kind of, you know, makes the difference between what's, what can be mechanical in, in designing and, you know, the architectural design, meaning that you don't only have to collect data, as you said before, but, you know, somehow create. That's what we do as human beings. So I think it's, it's something very important to, to remind to people, right? We're not just people who, I mean, we as, as designers are not only people who brings things together and gives a simple answer. There's always something that we have to interpret. Um, then there's another topic that is kind of delicate, I think. Um, you talked a lot about courtyards, right? This is what we also call the, the core lighting, you know, bringing light from inside, from the, the very inside of the, of the buildings. Um, as a way to um, provide light and life, which is also something very inspiring. And um, I was wondering, right, uh, is this a way to, um, you talked about connection, and I see also continuity, right? So um, I was wondering, first of all, if somehow it uh, kind of changes the way we are thinking about the boundary of a building. Right. That is something that some, sometimes is very strong, you know, and, and, and given. And sometimes it's, it's something that deserves to be somehow, you know, uh, disgregated and, and scattered and, and become transparent or somehow visible from outside and so on. So what, what's, the, 
what's the, the, the linking point between the, these two things? You know, light, daylight, and continuity from inside to outside and, and, and forth, and back and forth. And another question that I have, um, this thing, um, this approach about core lighting and, and courtyard might be a way to, you know, um, make the rooms that are part of the actual building a little with a smaller section, right? So that they can get daylight provided from many directions. Is that something that we can use? Also in, in, in you know, uh, ordinary architecture, it's like many floors with a very solid and simple shape. What do you think about that? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we always try to uh, judge in our project and see if we can reach is as much as transparency, in t especially in terms of the uh, ground floor. Because I think when, whenever we try to, uh, I mean, to, to create something that is more public as possible at the ground floor, we believe that uh, it is a great gift to the city, is a great gift to the building itself. And of course it can be a, a, a transparency just for the look, so you see through, but if you can also access to, you know, the, the Pirelli 35 with Snoetta, it, it can be a very interesting project because of that, because in some way we used to have two courtyards, there are private courtyards, nobody really see them, they, they all like say service courtyards and becomes like a, a, a transparent and accessible piazza that you pass through. That's really important and I think it's, it's really something that we always try to achieve in our projects. And there is also a way of uh, having two different kind of life, two different kind of light, because you always have a different light inside of a courtyard, so that's why we probably really lo love courtyard, because it's, it's of course a, it's a different light from having you know, a very far away uh, view, it's more control, it's more uh, vertical in some way, it's more, it's more similar to a skylight in some way, even if it's empty, if we don't have any roof on top, but it looks more like an interior uh, space than actually an exterior space. So let's say it's a hybrid uh, place where you have interior and exterior in some way. And I think that's very interesting, you know, as much as you create something that it got a public but also a private uh, space and outside but it looks more like an interior space with a skylight. I think that part is makes everything more interesting. Okay. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. It's also sort of, of a relation between the, the two, the fact that we, we light, probably we work vertically when we told before about vertical sections, the fact that we are looking at the project in a very vertical way. Uh, the other, the horizontal connection is something that brings you inside the heart of the project. So the courtyard becomes really a very important element for this. So it's a sort of this double, double connection of light and, 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 and let's say movement of, of people or anyway life that we, we try always to bring as deep as possible inside the building for what we... And, and it's funny because we are, as at, at the beginning, both said that we are Milanese and, and we know that this city is very linked with this idea of having this secret garden. So we always speak and, and discover that when you, talk, when you walk in this city, sometimes you enter in a, <coughs> in a big door at the entrance and then you discover another world. And I don't know, probably this is part of also our culture, uh, trying to always to go uh, through the buildings and to look and to discover something more. Uh, and we believe that this, this delicate way of working uh, with, with, with the courtyards is also a way to bring new life, as we said at the beginning. It's really it's very important for this because it, it changed completely the perception of the existing. Yeah, it's also something like, you know, sharing is caring. That's what we normally we sometimes do. We sometimes say about, you know, giving the space a new personality with bringing people inside and letting them move and see what's inside, what's outside and so on. 
Mark, yes, maybe... I would, I would like to add, I, I was really enjoying, so thank you very much uh, to be here today and, and to see your lecture. And uh, I quote, some, somebody say that Milano uh, is an impermanent city. Uh, this, in, in contrast with other cities in Italy, beauty, because Italy is so beautiful, but Milano has this really character of changing. Uh, and you, with your project, you were really showing this, and I would like to use a word that we use in Italy, but is a palincesto, is a typical, uh, that you have in the historical architecture where you really find times in buildings. So you don't, don't glaze in one time, but you really find. And, and in, you are giving this contemporary palincesto, which I think is extremely exciting because of, you know, bringing the city as a, as a living body, not as something static, it's a museum to see. And, and the chance of the, you know, working on the, the new section, because you really cut the ground, you go underground, so you work on the ground and also on the top and also on the facade and the skinning. So I think that there is a total palincest to what Spark is showing. And the, the chance of rooftops, for example, is amazing because really Milan has changed it. With the towers now, we have a new perspective, uh, which is really there. First of all, the skyscrapers give an orientation. From the city, you have now a clear orientation that before it was not so clear because it's flat. And then going up, you see the rooftops. So they become a chance. And I was really amazed and also the fact that I was saying at the beginning, you know, they, they, they went beyond their masters because they, as they were young, they, they had great experience, but also they are able to dialogue with masters with great respect now. So Porta Lupe, Zanuso, I mean, big, big, big dogs, okay? <laughs> I mean, and, and this is really amazing. And I think architecture should be like that. So we have always to be contemporary. <laughs> Uh, there's a question that might be uh, consistent with what you said just now. Uh, some, some, someone asks, um, the previous speakers in the series have emphasized the significance of, of local, like Denmark, Thailand, Austria in the, in the previous lectures, in the nature of their architecture. How do you characterize your work as Italian, if you do? I mean, is there something that you can... Of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of our... I think part of our work is really a lot related to uh, the post-war uh, Milanese architecture. And uh, because we love a lot of these masters, it was really a great responsibility to work on this building. So when we start working uh, uh, in the last, especially in the last 10 years, we, we were able to work on, on a lot of this uh, buildings from the post-war war, uh, period. And uh, as, uh, as you, you were saying before, it's, it's really important for us to try to always uh, uh, investigate the, the quality of the projects. We always say, like in the Zanuso project that we were telling you before, that that, that is not our project, of course, but it's not even more Marco Zanuso project as well is is really like working with two different architects, and we uh, we are always trying to think how Marco Zanuso will work in this environment with his culture, with this uh, situation of the city, because the city changed, so the project has to change. Uh, I think we are very much uh, related to this local architecture, but it, of course, is not only the classical Italian architecture is more about really the school of, uh, of uh, modern architecture in Milan and in North Italy especially. Yeah, okay. Um, there's another question, if we have time. Um, that makes me think about what we call the daylight design phase. If it exists, a, a specific stage in the design process where an architect sits and starts thinking about daylight, if it makes sense. Uh, so I was wondering if you have something like that or if daylight is always something in the background of your mind while designing, right? And this, this person is, uh, is asking, for example, do you work with daylight calculation tools in the office in the early design phase? Yes. yes. Obviously, the, the, the orientation, when we, as we show before, um, the, 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 two, the series of the project uh, about the envelopes, let's say, about the facade. Uh, these series of projects are very different 
but uh, you you can understand, uh, for example, the the Accenture project is, is is very interesting for this because we try to control each part of the of the of the shape of the project, the fa uh, the facade of the project, exactly in this direction. So to give the best performance of each side, and for each side, in a certain way, we we try to invent the best uh, solution for, for the building, for that side, for that part of the building. Uh, an interesting project for this point of view, I think, are the two itinerant restaurants. And this was the reason at the, begin the beginning we said that the fact that we don't have latitude, that we don't have a place, we don't have a temp correct temperature during the year. We didn't know orientation. We didn't know anything about this project. So we, we, we had to invent something that was able to go everywhere with any, in, 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 all the, in any situation. So this was one of the, f at the beginning, uh, since, uh, since the beginning was uh, the, the most difficult part, I think, that uh, um, generate the ideas uh, of, the, of the two projects, especially for the Cube project. We were very obsessed about this this element we because didn't have any idea of a location. <laughs> so it's no, we didn't know at the beginning, and it was really uh, that's 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 a, a good uh, answer to that question. As we didn't have any location, we were really stuck for a long time because we didn't know where to start. Right. Because you know, usually the first the main issue is where, where is the I? where am I? Where is the sun? We didn't have a sun, we didn't have a place, so yeah. that was really... You said something at the beginning, right? So the respect of what's, what's pre-existing somehow. Yeah. And, and if you think about the daylight field, it's something pre-existing, right? You just have to deal with it, but you have to know it, know where you are, where the sun is and so on. So if you don't, it's a really big challenge, so... No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, a ironically interesting that project because we didn't have our roots you know our roots w are really based on that on uh, location and analysis of a location analysis of a sun orientation and this kind of thing and we didn't have that and it was really we t it took a long time for us to try to find a, the right key way of working on that project because of that okay thank you so much um Maybe some other question. Um, natural light means something different as you travel around the world. Could you describe some of the specific qualities of Italian daylight through seasons? That's a very tricky mm -hmm. question. Well, well Italy is long. Exactly. <laughs> Italy is very long. And uh, uh, we were discussing just before, you know, how different the quality and the need of light is from Sicily to to Milan, for example. So I think, to as Bozen. yeah, to Bozen. <laughs> so it, it's very. It's, we we live in a very unique uh, country for that because as it's very long, we we have very different situation. In North Italy, of course, it's 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 usually very important because we have usually two different seasons. We have a season where. You know, Bo Bozen is like that. Bozen was very interesting as a project because, uh, funny enough, is is the coldest and the hottest city in Italy. It's so, like being exactly, it's right. very north, yeah. but as it yeah, is, it it in a, it is in a basket. Yeah, exactly. yeah, in a basket so it, it, it happens to be also the hottest uh, city. So, the idea of open up to the north the facade was, of course, to overlooking the mountain because that was yeah. one of the main thing and cover in the South Barbary was more, less interesting, but also because in the summertime we really have a, a strong, sun. strong sun and a strong uh, and hot weather. So uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting country because we, we need light, we, we starve for light in some period of, it, of the year, but in some other time we need to cover. So, uh, ideally, but the budget is not always there for that. You need to design buildings that are more uh, ready to change in during the period. You know, the Luxottica project is really one of the few projects that we were able to have a facade that is really uh, different according to the day of, of the time of the day and the season. Okay. Um 
some people just said uh, great project and great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, the, for example, this person asks, um, what's the, the weight of technical part of designing natural lighting? It might, might be something that we already answered before when talking about you know, analysis and tools. But that's because uh, they, they noticed that uh, natural light is handled mostly by its spiritual effects in your project. That's what they say. I, I, don't, I don't know. So they were, they were wondering if there's a technical part in the daylight design phase, since you know, they are, they are, um, your projects are pretty much you know, um, dealt with in terms of shape and skin and so on. If, if, is there a technical part uh, more than, than tools for, for daylight analysis? Uh, does it have a sense of meaning in this question? Yeah, well, we, we have seen, I think, some, you know, uh, isolux or something like that, especially yeah. on, it was on Cuba, I think, on mm -hmm. others. In the Cuba so and also, I think, the Pirelli. Yes, yeah, so a, a couple you yeah. show, a couple yeah. you show. Yeah. So where we always do that. I mean, uh, as uh, we were saying in the beginning, the data analysis is the starting point. That's okay. why we were discussing before about the traveling restaurant is so difficult. So, and one of the first data is really, you know, about sunlight. So that scheme is always part of our design process. It's al always part of our, our beginning of the process. It's not something that we do at the end, but it's really something that we start doing in the beginning. And especially for new buildings where you really have to uh, design where to put the, the volumes, you know, so it's really important for us because it, that means that also there are some shade that you can create uh, to the same building, you know, you, you create your own shade or you create your own way of looking at the sun. So, you know, there are very exciting projects where you really have to work from nothing and you and sun is really shaping the, the building. You know, it's not when you do a restoration, of course, you you try to work on what you have in that moment. So you try to, as we did in Angie, create some holes inside of the buildings to bring light. You bring you, nature also inside. Yeah, exactly. But when you do a new project, uh, the light is really shaping the, the, the project very much. You know, where you put your building, where you lay your building. And this probably answers also to this question. Uh, thank you very much for an inspiring lecture. Can you elaborate upon the balance between the quantities and qualities, which is probably something that we already said, you know, starting from something and, 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 and keeping... Um, I have a secret to tell about that, please. Yeah. I know that both of them, they go in the weekends in a beautiful place out in the landscape to regenerate and bring, and I think that they, they, they bring their urbanities, their projects are very urban, this naturality that they get from their own regeneration. That was mentioned in engine, you have the nature inside, the light, the quantity, the transparency and everything. So as I know that they do that, I understand that how much they bring this kind of, you know, they, of course, anytime you do architecture, you do an artifice. But how much this artifice is natural? It's natural because of the connection with light, of the connection with people, etc. So I, I feel quite that, how much they bring back <laughs> when they regenerate themselves from the weekends. And also, I think that we are lucky to be in, in this studio that we l like very much because we really have a, 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 a total control of what is the perception of natural light yeah, yeah. of the space. So we are used to work with the movement of light, this, this facade is totally a west facade, and the other one is an east one. So we always, we know, and as we told before, we know that in this, in this space, we really perceive this, the, 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 the movement of sun each day, and, uh, and the seasons, and we know exactly which are the, sh the shadows that buildings around can make in a certain moment of the year. Is, is very interesting, I think, and is a is a contact is a constant contact with nature, exactly. with natural light. That is, I think, that for us uh, is it's 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 very it's very important for our profession, because we sometimes we use this kind of light to control little models. Uh, so we try to put exactly in the tower and uh, to orientate it and we use it. So it's really a, a very physical element for us. 
and I think that in a certain way can answer also the fact that we 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 are so close to this element and and we try to to work a lot on it yeah i can guess that in the last year this topic has been much more interesting for for everybody you know since we have been forced to stay inside and therefore bringing the outside in could be a strategy for designers you know to yeah. provide a space that yeah. makes sense with with our physiology let's say you know yeah. we are kind of our, our genetic code bor was born in the outside yeah, you know yeah. under the sky yeah, so under the sky. That's probably our, our more, most natural it's environment. Easy. Inside of us, bring us the relation with the sun and understand that we are r running around it <laughs> because we see it moving, but it's the country. Yeah. Uh, the project, I think that uh, it will be very interesting for this, for this is, is going to be the Luxotic headquarter because there really <coughs> you, you can understand the quality of internal space in relation with the external space. And the fact that this, this, uh, this frame, in a certain way, doesn't exist. It's really a building where the, the, the perimeter, the frame of the, uh, the envelope does not exist. And so that is, 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 is really astonishing. Each time uh, we go on site, and now that is going to finish the project, uh, we are really uh, astonished about this. It's, it's, and we are very happy, I think, that the, the, the final result. It's breaking the boundaries between the macro yeah. space outside and micro space inside is something very challenging, the porosity of the skins. And because very often we're used to talk about double skins as a, as a technical way to create transparency. But then when you, when you look at the past or what they've yeah. they done with double skins, it's very yeah. often they are full of steel, yeah, full of elements, much, uh, much, yeah. cables, I think. Yeah. And so in, in that building that is not very big, but very delicate, we work really in the direction of eliminate everything. Subtraction. Subtraction, subtraction of everything. Everything. So it's a difficult, minimized... It's the uh, most difficult thing to yeah. subtract. No, I can tell you this <laughs> is... Because to add is easy. Yes. To subtract is difficult. Okay, well, there's a very specific question that I, I don't know if, it, uh, if you have an answer to uh, about the luminance value on the walls. Maybe it's something that we're not so interested now in, in answering. It's really you know, specific about scientific measurements, so I don't know. Uh, but there's another one that could be the last one maybe. Um, what are, in your opinion, the most exciting innovations in construction and design in the recent years? Is there anything that you would comes to your mind? Well, uh, uh, we did a, a, a long research with uh, our research team about wood and, cons wood and construction, and uh, of course we know that uh, in Europe is already very, very common. But here in Italy, is not as common as uh, in France or in the North countries. And uh, we always say that uh, probably the most modern material now is wood, which is, you know, the most ancient uh, material as well. But the way now is, is used for construction, it, it makes uh, wood uh, really a new thing, a very contemporary one. And of course, the, the impact on, uh, on the environment is, it, it helps so much with the impact that uh, we believe that that's really something that it will be more and more used in the future. And glass as well. It's, it's funny enough as two uh, very traditional materials are now probably the most contemporary because glass made so much uh, innovation, made so much new innovation in the last years that now is really in incredible in the way can stop sun, can control sun and at the same time give transparency you know you, now you can almost have a, 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 a facade so facing south and control the sun which was impossible like 10 years ago so it, it's really interesting how new materials sometimes they are just the most traditional one you just need to make more research on that how to use them in yes. the best way for this time, for example. Exactly. That's a very good answer. Uh, Marco, do you have anything more to...? No, was, uh, you know, also this final question, I, I totally agree. You know, the man comes out from a cave, so before he was never an architect. So the first material of architecture is wood. And then, you know, bricks comes afterwards and, and so on. So the, the really first one, having that, 
uh, it's, you know, the, the huts. And so yeah, I'm totally agree with him that now this new way to make new huts uh, in a very technical CNC cutting complex, uh, cross line, glue line, whatever you want, I mean, it's showing a very strong potential of this material, both for cladding when you see it and also sometimes you don't, totally don't see it, it's inside the structure. So I think as a research is totally agree. Yeah, and then we have to understand that pr the process of construction probably is one of the uh, way, the, the, the most, r the big revolution that we are looking at now. And also the process, yes. uh, the, the controlling uh, the process, uh, how we can control the process. And information modeling, information yeah, yeah. Model, beam, beam modeling. I mean, we, we understand today that what we are doing now, it wouldn't be possible 10 years ago. This, uh, and with the new modeling and new way of, of controlling the, proce the process and, and drawing, uh, really we can, we can achieve something that before was impossible. So I think that this is another link to materials. Is not only the simple way of, of using that, but also how you how you learn to use them together. And also, let me connect one thing for the interest maybe of the, the, the speaker is about cognitive building. So how you connect with sensors in order to communicate. So all these kind of senses that we don't we have, or sometimes we can get informations, are is, is an interesting step beyond for the future. Okay, I think this is it. So thank you all for, for being part of the, the Light Talks. Thank you, um, Filippo and Michele, for your, I'd say, in inspiring lecture and with so many topics to, to, you know, to enter. And uh, obviously, thank you, Marco Imperadori and the Politecnico di Milano for hosting this, this event. Um, I remind you that this session has been recorded at, that you will be able to find it on the website, uh, thelatinarchitecture.com, shortly after this event. And uh, there will be more talks in the next weeks, so stay tuned and possibly if you want, join us and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>